Welcome to Sunday Horror Classics on the Hidden Corners. Today we are reading another story from Carnacki, the Ghost Hunter. Carnacki is a fictional occult detective created by William Hope Hodgson. Carnacki invites his four friends to dinner to hear of his latest case. Join us on Sunday Horror Classics as Justin King reads Carnacki, the Ghost Hunter. The Thing Invisible Carnegie had just returned to Cheyenne Walk, Chelsea. I was aware of this interesting fact by reason of the curt and quaintly worded postcard which I was rereading, and by which I was requested to present myself at his house, not later than seven o'clock on that evening. Mr. Carnegie had, as I and the others of his strictly limited circle of friends knew, been away in Kent for the past three weeks. But beyond that, we had no knowledge. Carnegie was generally secretive and curt, and spoke only when he was ready to speak. When this stage arrived, I and his three other friends, Jessup, Arkwright, and Taylor, would receive a card or a wire asking us to call. Not one of us ever willingly missed, for after a thoroughly sensible little dinner, Carnegie would snuggle down into his big armchair, light his pipe, and wait whilst we arranged ourselves comfortably in our accustomed seats and nooks. Then he would have begun to talk. Upon this particular night, I was the first to arrive and found Carnegie sitting, quietly smoking over a paper. He stood up, shook me firmly by the hand, pointed to a chair, and sat down again, never having uttered a word. For my part, I said nothing either. I knew the man too well to bother him with questions or the weather, so I took a seat and a cigarette. Presently, the three others turned up, and after that, we spent a comfortable and busy hour at dinner. With dinner over, Carnegie snuggled himself down into his great chair, as I have said was his habit, filled his pipe and puffed for a while, his gaze directed thoughtfully at the fire. The rest of us, if I may so express it, made ourselves cozy, each after his own particular manner. A minute or so later, Carnegie began to speak, ignoring any preliminary remarks and going straight to the subject of the story we knew he had to tell. I had just come back from Sir Alfred Jonak's place of Burton Tree in South Kent, he began, without removing his gaze from the fire. Most extraordinary things have been happening down there lately, and Mr. George Jarnock, the eldest son, why had to ask me to run over and see whether I could help them clear up matters for a bit. So I went. When I got there, I found that they had an old chapel attached to the castle, which has had quite a distinguished reputation for being what is popularly termed haunted. They have been rather proud of this, as I managed to discover, until quite lately when something very disagreeable occurred, which served to remind them that family ghosts are not always content as I might say, to remain purely ornamental. It sounds almost laughable, I know, to hear of a long-respected supernatural phenomenon growing unexpectedly dangerous. And in this case, the tale of the haunting was considered as little more than an old myth, except after nightfall, when possibly it became more plausible-seeming. But however this may be, there was no doubt at all but that which I might term the haunting essence which lived in the place had become suddenly dangerous, Deadly dangerous, too. The old butler being nearly stabbed to death one night in the chapel with a peculiar old dagger. It is, in fact, this dagger which is popularly supposed to haunt the chapel. At least there has always been a story handed down in the family that this dagger would attack any enemy who should dare to venture into the chapel after nightfall. But, of course, uh, this has been taken with just about the same amount of seriousness that people take most ghost tales, and that is not usual of a worryingly real nature. I mean that most people never quite know how much or how little they believe of matters abhuman or abnormal, and generally they never have an opportunity to learn. And indeed, as you are all aware, I am as big a skeptic concerning the truth of ghost tales as any man you are likely to meet. Only I am what I might term an unprejudiced skeptic. I am not given to either believing or disbelieving things on principle, as I found many idiots prone to be, and what is more, some of them not ashamed to boast on the insane fact. I view all reported hauntings as unproven until I have examined into them, and I am bound to admit that ninety-nine cases and a hundred turn out to be sheer bosh and fancy. But the hundredth? Hell, if it not for the hundredth, I should have few stories to tell you, eh? Of course, after the attack on the butler, it became evident that there was at least something in the old story concerning the dagger, and I found everyone in a half-belief that the queer old weapon did really strike the butler, either by the aid of some inherent force, which I found them peculiarly unable to explain, or else by the hand of some invisible thing or monster in the outer world. 
From considerable experience, I knew that it was much more likely that the butler had been knifed by some vicious and quite material human. Naturally, the first thing to do was to test this probability of human agency, and I set to work to make a pretty drastic examination of the people who knew most about the tragedy. The results of this examination both pleased and surprised me, for it left me with very good reasons to believe that I have come upon one of the most extraordinarily rare, true manifestations of the exclusion of a force from the outside. In more popular phraseology, a genuine case of haunting. These are the facts. On the previous Sunday evening but one, Sir Alfred Jarnock's household had attended family service as usual, in the chapel. You see, the rector goes over to officiate twice each Sunday after concluding his duties at the public church about three miles away. At the end of the service in the chapel, Sir Alfred Jarnock, his son Mr. George Jarnock, and the rector had stood for a couple of minutes talking, while Salt Barrett the butler went round putting out the candles. Suddenly, the rector remembered that he had left his small prayer book on the communion table in the morning. He turned and asked the butler to get it for him before he blew out the chancel candles. Now, I have particularly called your attention to this because it is important that it provides witnesses in a most fortunate manner at an extraordinary moment. You see, the rector's turning to speak to Bellet had naturally caused both Sir Alfred Yarnick and his son to glance in the direction of the butler. And it was at this identical instant, and whilst all three were looking at him, that the old butler was stabbed, there full in the candlelight before their eyes. The rector's version was clear and vivid and he had evidently received the astonishment of his life. He pictured to me the whole affair, Bellet up at the chancel gate going for the prayer book and absolutely alone, and then the blow out of the void he described it, and the force prodigious, the old man being driven headlong to the body of the chapel. Like the kick of a great horse, the rector said, his benevolent old eyes bright and intense with the effort he had actually witnessed, in defiance of all that he had hitherto believed. When I left him, he went back to the writing which he had put aside when I appeared, I felt sure that he was developing the first unorthodox sermon that he had ever evolved. He was a dear old chap, and I should certainly like to have heard it. The last man I visited was the butler. He was, of course, in a frightfully weak and shaking condition, but he could tell me nothing that did not point to there being a power abroad in the chapel. He told the same tale in every minute particle that I had learned from the others. He had been just going up to put out the altar candles and fetch the rector's book, when something struck him an enormous blow high up on the left breast, and he was driven headlong into the aisle. Examination had shown that he had been stabbed by the dagger, of which I will tell you more in a moment, that hung always above the altar. The weapon had entered, fortunately, some inches above the heart, just under the collarbone, which had been broken by the stupendous force of the blow, the dagger itself being driven clean through the body and out the scapula behind. The poor old fellow could not talk much, and I soon left him, but what he had told me was sufficient to make it unmistakable that no living person had been within yards of him when he was attacked, and as I knew, this fact was verified by three capable and responsible witnesses independent of Bellet himself. The thing now was to search the chapel, which is small and extremely old. It is very massively built and entered only through one door, which leads out of the castle itself, and the key which, which is kept by Sir Alfred Yarnick, the butler having no duplicate. The shape of the chapel is oblong, and the altar is railed off after a usual fashion. There are two tombs in the body of the place, but none in the chancel, which is bare, except for the tall candlesticks and the chancel rail, beyond which is the undraped altar of solid marble, upon which stands four small candlesticks, two at each end. Above the altar hangs the Wayful Dagger, as I learned it was named. I fancy the term has been taken from an old vellum which describes the dagger and its supposed abnormal properties. I took the dagger down and examined it minutely and with method. The blade is ten inches long, two inches broad at the base, and tapering to a rounded but sharp point, rather peculiar, and it is double-edged. The metal sheath is curious for having a cross piece, which is taken for the fact that the sheath itself has continued three parts up the hilt of the dagger, in a most inconvenient fashion. Gives it the appearance of a cross. That this is not unintentional is shown by the engraving of the Christ crucified upon one side, whilst on the other in Latin is the inscription, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. A quaint and rather terrible conjunction of ideas. Upon the blade of the dagger is graved in, in old English capitals, I watch, I strike. On the butt of the hilt there is carved deeply a pentacle. This is a pretty accurate description of the peculiar old weapon that has had the curious and uncomfortable reputation of being able, either of its own accord or in the hand of something invisible, to strike murderously at any enemy of the Jarnock family who may chance to enter the chapel after nightfall. I might tell you here and now that before I left, I had very good reason to put certain doubts behind me, for I tested the deadliness of the thing itself. 
As you know, however, at this point of my investigation, I was still at the stage where I considered the existence of a supernatural force unproven. In the meanwhile, I treated the chapel drastically, sounding and scrutinizing the walls and floor, dealing with them almost foot by foot, and particularly examining the two tombs. At the end of this search, I had in a ladder, and made a close survey of the groined roof. I passed three days in this fashion, and by the evening of the third day, I had proved to my entire satisfaction that there is no place in the whole of that chapel where any living being could have hidden, and also that the only way of ingress and egress to and from the chapel is through the doorway which leads into the castle, the door of which is always kept locked, and the key kept by Sir Alfred Yarnick himself, as I have told you. I mean, of course, that this doorway is the only entrance practicable to material people. Yes, as you will see, even had I discovered some other opening, secret or otherwise, it would not have helped at all to explain the mystery of the incredible attack in a normal fashion. For the butler, as you know, was struck in a full sight of the rector Sir Jarnock and his son, and old Bellet himself knew that no living person had touched him. Out of the void, the rector had described the inhumanly brutal attack. Out of the void. A strange feeling he gives one, eh? And this is the thing that I have been called in to bottom. At the considerable thought, I decided on a plan of action. I proposed to Sir Arthur Jarnock that I should spend a night in the chapel, and keep a constant watch upon the dagger. But to this, the old knight, a little wise and nervous man, would not listen for a moment. He at least, I felt assured, had no doubt of the reality of some dangerous supernatural force, a roam at night in the chapel. He informed me that it has been his habit every evening to lock the chapel door, so that no one might foolishly or heedlessly run the risk of any peril that it might hold at night and that he would not allow me to attempt such a thing after what had happened to the butler. I could see that Sir Alfred Yarnick was very much in earnest, and would evidently have held himself to blame had he allowed me to make the experiment and any harm come to me. So I said nothing in argument, and presently, pleading the fatigue of his years and health, he said, Good night, and left me, having given me the impression of being a polite or rather superstitious old gentleman. That night, however, whilst I was undressing, I saw how I might achieve the thing I wished, and be able to enter the chapel after dark, without making Sir Albert Njarnik nervous. On the morrow, when I borrowed the key, I would take an impression and have a duplicate made. Then with my private key, I could do just what I liked. In the morning, I carried out my idea. I borrowed the key as I wanted to take a photograph of the chancel by daylight. When I'd done this, I locked up the chapel and handed the key to Sir Alfred Njarnik, having first taken an impression in soap. I brought out the exposed plate and its slide with me. But the camera I had left exactly as it was, as I wanted to take a second photograph of the chancel that night, from the same position. I took the dark slide into Burton Tree, also the cake of soap with the impress. The soap I left with the local ironmonger, who was something of a locksmith and promised to let me have my duplicate finished, if I would call in two hours. This I did, having in the meantime found out a photographer where I developed the plate, and let it to dry, telling him I would call next day. At the end of the two hours, I went for my key and found it ready, much to my satisfaction. And then I returned to the castle. After dinner that evening, I played billiards with young John for a couple of hours. Then I had a cup of coffee and went up to my room, telling him I was feeling awfully tired. He nodded and told me he felt the same way. I was glad, for I wanted the house to settle as soon as possible. I locked the door of my room, then from under the bed, where I had hidden them early in the evening. I drew out several fine pieces of plate armor, which I had removed from the armory. There was also a shirt of chainmail, the sort of quilted hood of mail to go over the head. I buckled on the plate armor and found it extraordinarily uncomfortable, and overall I drew on the chain mail. I know nothing about armor from what I had learned since, and must have put on parts of two suits. Anyway, I felt beastly, clamped and clumsy and unable to move my arms and legs naturally. But I knew that the thing I was looking of doing called for some sort of protection for my body. Over the armor I pulled on my dressing gown and shoved my revolver into one of the side pockets and my repeating flashlight into the other. My dark lantern I carried in my hand. As soon as I was ready, I went out into the passage and listened. I had been some considerable time by making my preparations and found that now the big hole and staircase were in darkness, and all the house seemed quiet. I stepped back and closed and locked the door. Then very slowly and silently I went downstairs to the hall and turned into the passage that led to the chapel. I reached the door and tried my key. It fitted perfectly, and a moment later, I was in the chapel, with the door locked behind me, and all about me the utter dree silence of the place, with just the faintest showings of the outlines of the stained leaded windows, making the darkness and lonesomeness almost the more apparent. Now it would be silly to say I did not feel uneasy. I felt very uneasy indeed. You just try, any of you, to imagine yourself standing in the dark silence, and remembering not only the legend that was attached to the place, but what had really happened to the old butler only a little while ago. 
I can tell you as I stood there, I could believe that something invisible was coming towards me in the air of the chapel. Yet I had to go through with the business, and I just took hold of my little bit of courage and set to work. First of all, I switched on my light. Then I began a careful tour of the place, examining every corner and nook. I found nothing unusual. At the chancel gate, I held up my lamp and flashed the light of the dagger. It hung there right enough above the altar, but I remember thinking of the word demure as I looked at it. However, I pushed the thought away, for what I was doing needed no addition of uncomfortable thoughts. I completed the tour of the place with a constantly growing awareness of its utter chill and unkind desolation. An atmosphere of cold dismalness seemed to be everywhere, and the quiet was abominable. At the conclusion of my search, I walked across to where I had left my camera focused upon the chancel. From the satchel that I had put beneath the tripod, I took out a dark slide and inserted it in the camera, drawing the shutter. After that, I uncapped the lens, pulled up my flashlight apparatus, and pressed the trigger. There was an intense, brilliant flash that made the whole of the interior of the chapel jump into sight, and disappear as quickly. Then in the light from my lantern, I inserted the shutter into the slide, and reversed the slide, so as to have a fresh plate ready to expose at any time. After I had done this, I shut off my lantern and sat in one of the pews near to my camera. I cannot say what I expected to happen, but I had an extraordinary feeling, almost a conviction, that something peculiar or horrible would soon occur. It was, you know, as if I knew. An hour passed of absolute silence. The time I knew by the far-off faint chime of a clock that had been erected over the stables. I was beastly cold, for the whole place was without any kind of heating pipes or furnace, as I had noticed during my search, so that the temperature was sufficiently uncomfortable to suit my frame of mind. I felt like a human periwinkle encased in boilerplate and frozen with cold and funk. And you know, somehow the dark about me seemed to press coldly against my face. I cannot say whether any of you had ever had the feeling, but if you have, you will know just how disgustingly unnerving it is. And then, all at once, I had a horrible sense that something was moving in the place. It was not that I could hear anything, but I kind of had a intuitive knowledge that something had stirred in the darkness. Can you imagine how it felt? Suddenly, my courage went. I put up my mailed arms over my face. I wanted to protect it. I had gotten a sudden sickening feeling that something was hovering over me in the dark. Talk about fright. I could have shouted if it had not been afraid of the noise. And then abruptly I heard something. Away up in the aisle there sounded a dull clang of metal, as it might be the thread of a mailed heel upon the stone of the aisle. I sat immovable. I was fighting with all my strength to get back my courage. I could not take my arms down from over my face, but I knew that it was getting hold of the gritty part of me again. And suddenly I made the mighty effort and lowered my arms. I held my face up in the darkness. And I tell you, I respect myself for the act because I thought truly at that moment that I was going to die. But I think just then, by the slow revulsion of feeling which had assisted my effort, I was less sick in that instant, at the thought of having to die, than at the knowledge of the utter weak cowardice that had so unexpectedly shaken me all the bits for a time. Do I make myself clear? You understand, I feel sure, that the sense of respect which I spoke of is not really unhealthy egotism. Because, you see, I am not blind to the state of mind which helped me. I meant that if I had uncovered my face by a sheer effort of will, unhelped by any revulsion of feeling, I should have done a thing much more worthy of mention. But even as it was, there were elements in the act worthy of respect. You follow me, don't you? Anyway, and you know, nothing touched me, after all. So that, in a little while, I'd got back to a bit of my normal, and felt steady enough to go through with the business without any more funking. I dare say a couple of minutes passed, and then away up near the chancel there came again that clang, as though an armored foot stepped cautiously. By Jove! But it made me stiffen. And suddenly the thought came to the sound I heard might be the rattle of the dagger above the altar. It was not a particularly sensible notion, for the sound was far too heavy and resonant for such a cause. Yet, as can be easily understood, my reason was bound to submit somewhat to my fancy at such a time. I remember now that the idea of an insensate thing becoming animate and attacking me did not occur to me without any sense of possibility or reality. I thought, rather, in a vague way of some invincible monster of outer space fumbling at the dagger. I remember the old reckless description of the attack of the butler, of the void, and he had described the stupendous force of the blows as being like the kick of a great horse. You can see how uncomfortably my thoughts were running. I felt round swiftly and cautiously for my lantern. I found it close to me on the pew seat, and with a sudden, jerky movement, I switched on the light. I flashed it up the aisle, to and fro across the chancel, but I could see nothing to frighten me. I turned quickly and set the gent of light darting across and across the rear end of the chapel. 
then on each side of me, before and behind, up at the roof and down at the marble floor. But nowhere was there any visible thing to put me in fear. Not a thing that need have set my flesh thrilling. Just the quiet chapel, cold and eternally silent. You know the feeling. I had been standing whilst I set the light about the chapel, but now I pulled out my revolver, and then with a tremendous effort of will switched off the light, and sat down again in the darkness to continue my constant watch. It seemed to me that quite half an hour, or even more, must have passed after this, during which no sound had broken the intense stillness. I had grown less nervously tense, for the flashing of the light round the place had made me feel less out of all bounds than normal. It had given me something of that unreasoned sense of safety that a nervous child obtains at night by covering its head up with the bedclothes. This just about illustrates the completely human illogicalness of the workings of my feelings, for, as you know, whatever creature, thing, or being it was that had made that extraordinary and horrible attack on the old butler, it had certainly not been visible. And so you must picture me sitting there in the dark, clumsy with armor, with my revolver in one hand and nursing my lantern ready with the other. And then it was, after this little time of partial relief from intense nervousness, that there came a fresh strain on me, for somewhere in the utter quiet of the chapel I thought I heard something. I listened, tense and rigid, my heart booming just a little in my ears for a moment. Then I thought I heard it again. I felt sure that something had moved at the top of the aisle. I strained in the darkness to hark, and my eyes showed me blackness within blackness wherever I glanced, so that I took no heed of what they told me. For even if I looked at the dim loom of the stained window at the top of the chancel, my sight gave me the shapes of vague shadows passing noiseless and ghostly across constantly. There was a time of almost peculiar silence horrible to me, as I felt just then. And suddenly I seemed to hear a sound again nearer to me, and repeated infinitely stealthily. It was as if a vast, soft tread were coming slowly down the aisle. Can you imagine how I felt? I do not think you can. I did not move any more than the stone effigies of the two tombs, but sat there, stiffened. I fancy now that I heard the tread all about the chapel. And then, you know, it was just as sure in the moment that I could not hear it, that I had never heard it. Some particularly long minutes passed about this time, but I think my nerves must have quieted for a bit. For I remember being sufficiently aware of my feelings to realize that the muscles of my shoulders ached with the way that they must have been contracted as I sat there hunching myself rigid. Mind you, I was still in a disgusting funk, but what I might call the imminent sense of danger seemed to have eased from around me. At any rate, I felt, in some curious fashion, that there was a respite, a temporary sensation of malignity from around me. It is impossible to word my feelings more clearly to you, for I cannot see them more clearly than this, myself. Yet you must picture me as sitting there, free from strain, for the nerve tension was so great that my heart action was a little out of normal control, the blood beat making dull booming in the times of my ears, with the result that I had the sensation I could not hear acutely. This is a simple beastly feeling, especially under such circumstances. I was sitting like this, listening, as I might say, with body and soul, when suddenly I got that hideous conviction again that something was moving in the air of the place. The feeling sensed to stiffen me as I sat, and my head appeared to tighten, as if all the scalp had grown tense. This was so real that I suffered an actual pain, most peculiar and at the same time intense. The whole head pained. I had a fierce desire to cover my face again with my mailed arms, but I fought it off. If I had given way to that, I should simply have bunked straight out of the place. I sat and sweated coldly. Well, that's the bold truth, with the creep busy at my spine. And then abruptly, once more, I thought I heard the sound of that huge, soft tread in the aisle, and this time closer to me. There was an awful little silence, during which I had the feeling that something enormous was bending over towards me from the aisle. And then through the booming of the blood in my ears, there came a slight sound from the place where my camera stood. A disagreeable sort of slithering sound and then a sharp tap. I had my lantern ready in my left hand and now I snapped it on, desperately, and shone it straight above me for I had a conviction that there was something there, but I saw nothing. Immediately I flashed the light at the camera and along the aisle, but again there was nothing visible. I wheeled round, shooting the beam of light in a great circle about the place. To and fro I shone it, jerking it here and there, but it showed me nothing. I had stood up the instant that I had seen that there was nothing in sight over me and now I determined to visit the chancel and see whether the dagger had been touched. I stepped out of the pew into the aisle, and here I came to an abrupt pause, for an almost invisible, sick repugnance was fighting me back from the upper part of the chapel. A constant, uneasy prickling went up and down my spine. A dull ache took me from the small of the back, and I fought with myself to conquer this sudden new feeling of terror and horror. I tell you that no one who has not been through these kinds of experiences have any idea of the sheer, actual physical pain attended upon and resulting from 
the intense nerve strain that ghostly fright sets up in the human system. I stood there feeling positively ill, but I got myself in hand, as it were, in about half a minute, and then I went walking, I expect as jerky as a mechanical tin man, and switching the light from side to side, before and behind and over my head continually. And the hand that held my revolver sweated so much that the thing fairly slipped in my fist. <laughs> it does not sound very heroic, does it? I passed through the short chancel and reached the step that led up to the small gate in the chancel's rail. I threw the beam from my lantern upon the dagger. Yes, I thought, it's all right. Abruptly it seemed to me that there was something wanting, and I leaned forward over the chancel gate to peer. Holding the light high, my suspicion was hideously correct. The dagger had gone. Only the cross-shaped sheath hung there above the altar. In a sudden, frightened flash of animation, I pictured the thing adrift in the chapel, moving here and there, as though of its own volition, for whatever force wielded it was certainly beyond visibility. I turned my head stiffly over to the left, glancing frightenedly behind me, and flashing the light to help my eyes. In the same instant, I was struck a tremendous blow over the left breast, and hurtled backward from the chancel rail into the aisle. My armor clanking loudly in the hall was silence. I landed on my back and slid along on the polished marble. My shoulder struck the corner of a pew front and brought me up half stunned. I scrambled to my feet, horribly sick and shaken. But the fear that was on me, making little of that at the moment. I was minus both revolver and lantern and utterly bewildered as to just where I was standing. I bowed my head and made a scrambling run in the complete darkness and dashed into a pew. I jumped back, staggering, got my bearings a little and raced down the center of the aisle putting my mailed arms over my face. I plunged into my camera, hurtling among the pews. I crashed into the font and reeled back. Then I was at the exit. I fumbled madly in my dressing gown pocket for the key. I found it and scraped at the door feverishly for the keyhole. I found the keyhole, turned the key and burst the door open, and was into the passage. I slammed the door and leaned hard against it, gasping while I fell crazily again for the keyhole. This time to lock the door upon what was in the chapel. I succeeded and began to feel my way stupidly along the wall of the corridor. Presently I had come to the big hole, and so in a little to my room. In my room I sat for a while until I had steadied down something to the normal. After a time I commenced to strip off the armor. I saw then that both the chainmail and the plate armor had been pierced over the breast, and then suddenly it came home to me, as the thing had struck from my heart. Stripping rapidly I found that the skin of the breast over the heart had just been cut sufficiently to allow little blood to stain my shirt, and nothing more only the whole breast was badly bruised and intensely painful. You can imagine what would have happened if I had not worn the armor. In any case, it is a marvel that I was not knocked senseless. I did not go to bed at all that night, but sat upon the edge, thinking, and waiting for the dawn, for I had to remove my litter before Sir Alfred Yarnock would enter, about to hide from him the fact that I had managed a duplicate key. So soon as the pale light of the morning had strengthened sufficiently to show me the various details of my room, I made my way down to the chapel, very silently, and with tense nerves, I opened the door. The chill light of the dawn made distinct the whole place. Everything seemed instinct with a ghostly, unearthly quiet. Can you get the feeling? I waited several minutes at the door, allowing the morning to grow, and likewise my courage, I suppose. Presently, the rising sun threw an old beam right in through the big east window, making colored sunshine all the length of the chapel. And then, with a tremendous effort, I forced myself to enter. I went up the aisle to where I had overthrown my camera in the darkness. The legs of the tripod were sticking up from the interior of a pew, and I expected to find the machine smashed to pieces. Yet beyond that, the ground glass was broken. There was no real damage done. I replaced the camera in the position for which I had taken the previous photography, but the slide containing the plate I had exposed by flashlight I removed and put into one of my side pockets, regretting that I had not taken a second flash picture at the instant when I heard those strange sounds up in the chancel. Having tidied my photograph apparatus, I went to the chancel to recover my lantern and revolver, which had both, as you know, been knocked from my hands when I was stabbed. I found the lantern lying hopelessly bent with smashed lenses just under the pulpit. My revolver should have held until my shoulder struck the pew, for it was lying there in the aisle, just about where I believed I cannoned into the pew corner. It was quite undamaged. Having secured these two articles, I walked up the chancel rail to see whether the dagger had returned, or been returned to its sheath above the altar. Before, however, I reached the chancel rail, I had a slight shock, for there on the floor of the chancel, about a yard away from where I had been struck, lay the dagger, quiet and demure upon the polished marble pavement. I wonder whether you will, any of you, understand the nervousness that took me at the sight of the thing. With a sudden, unreasoned action, I jumped forward and put my foot on it to hold it there. Can you understand? Do you? And you know, I could not scoop down to pick it up with my hands for quite a minute, I should think. Afterwards, when I had done so, however, 
and handled it a little. This feeling passed away in my reason, and also I expect the daylight, made me feel like I was a little bit of an ass. Quite natural, though, I assure you. Yet it was a new kind of fear to me. I'm taking no notice of the cheap joke about the ass. I am talking about the curiousness of learning in that moment a new shade of quality of fear that had hitherto been outside of my knowledge or imagination. Does it interest you? I examined the dagger minutely, turning it over and over in my hands and never, as I suddenly discovered, holding it loosely. It was as if I was subconsciously surprised that it lay quiet in my hands. Yet even this feeling passed largely after a short while. The curious weapon showed no signs of the blow, except that dull color of the blade was slightly brighter than the rounded point that had cut through the armor. Presently, when I made an end of staring at the dagger, I went up the chancel step and in through the little gate. Then kneeling upon the altar, I replaced the dagger in its sheath and came outside of the rail again, closing the gate after me and feeling awarely uncomfortable because the horrible old weapon was back again into its accustomed place. I suppose, without analyzing my feelings very deeply, I had an unreasoned and only half-conscious belief that there was a greater probability of danger when the dagger is hung in its five-century resting place than when it was out of it. Yet somehow I don't think this is a very good explanation, when I remember the demure look the thing seemed to have when I saw it lying on the floor of the chancel. Only I know this, that when I replaced the dagger, I had quite a touch of nerves, and I stopped only to pick up my lantern from where I placed it whilst I examined the weapon. After which I went down to the quiet aisle at a pretty quick walk, and so got out of the place. That the nerve tension had been considerable, I realized, when I locked the door behind me. I felt no inclination now to think of old Sir Alfred as a hypochondriac, because he had taken such hyper-seeming precautions regarding the chapel, I had a sudden wonder as to whether he might not have some knowledge of a long prior tragedy in which the dagger had been concerned. I returned to my room, washed, shaved, and dressed, after which I read a while. Then I went downstairs and got the acting butler to give me some sandwiches and a cup of coffee. Half an hour later, I was heading for Burden Tree, as hard as I could walk, for a sudden idea had come to me which I was anxious to test. I reached the town a little before 8.30 and found the local photographer with his shutters still up. I did not wait, but knocked until he appeared with his coat off evidently in the act of dealing with his breakfast. In a few words, I made clear that I wanted the use of his dark room immediately, and this he had once placed at my disposal. I had brought with me the slide which contained the plate that I had used with the flashlight, and as soon as I was ready, I set to work to develop. Yet it was not the plate which I had exposed that I first put into solution, but the second plate which has been ready in the camera during all the time of my waiting in the darkness. You see, the lens had been uncapped all that while, so that the whole chancel had been, as it were, under observation. You all know something of my experience in lightless photography, that is, appreciating light. It was x-ray work that started me in that direction. Yet you must understand, though I was attempting to develop this unexposed plate, I had no definite idea of results, nothing more than a vague hope that it might show me something. Yet because of the possibilities, it was with the most intense and absorbing interest that I watched the plate under the action of the developer. Presently I saw a faint smudge of black appear in the upper part, and after that others indistinct and wavering of outline. I held the negative up to the light. The marks were rather small, were almost entirely confined to one end of the plate, but as I have said, lacked definiteness. And yet such as it were, they were sufficient to make me very excited, and I shoved the thing quickly back into the solution. For some minutes further, I watched it, lifting it out once or twice to make a more exact scrutiny, but could not imagine what the markings might represent. Now suddenly it occurred to me that in one of the two places that certainly had shape suggested of a cross-hilted dagger, yet the shapes were sufficiently indefinite to make me careful not to let myself be over-impressed by the uncomfortable resemblance. Though I must confess, the very thought was sufficient to set some odd thrills adrift in me. I carried development a little further, that put the negative into the hypo, and commenced to work upon the other plate. This came up nicely, and very soon I had a real decent negative that I appeared similar in every aspect, except for the difference in lighting, to the negative I had taken during the previous day. I fixed the plate, then having washed it both in the unexposed one for a few minutes under the tap. I put them into methylated spirits for 15 minutes, after which I carried them into the photographer's kitchen and dried them in the oven. Whilst the two plates were drying, the photographer and I made an enlargement from the negative I had taken by daylight. Then we did the same with the two that I had just developed, washing them as quickly as possible, for I was not troubling about the permacy of the prints, and drying them with spirits. When this was done, I took them to the window and made a thorough examination commencing with the one that appeared to show shadowy daggers in several places. Yet though it was now enlarged, I was still unable to feel convinced that the marks truly represented anything abnormal. 
and because of this I put it on one side, determining not to let my imagination play too large a part in constructing weapons out of the indefinite outlines. I took up the two other enlargements, both of the chancel, as you will remember, and commenced to compare them. For some minutes I examined them without being able to distinguish any difference in the scene they portrayed, and then abruptly I saw something in which they varied. In the second enlargement, the one made from the flashlight negative, the dagger was not in its sheath. Yet I had felt sure that it was there but a few minutes before I took the photograph. After this discovery, I began to compare the two enlargements in a very different manner from my previous scrutiny. I borrowed a pair of calipers from the photographer, and with these I carried out a most methodical and exact comparison of the details, shown in the two paragraphs. Suddenly, I came upon something that set me all tingling with excitement. I threw the calipers down, paid the photographer, and walked out through the shop into the street. The three enlargements I took with me, making them into a roll as I went. At the corner of the street, I had the luck to get a cab and was soon back to the castle. I hurried to my room and put the photographs away. Then I went down to see whether I could find Sir Alfred Yarnick, but Mr. George Yarnick, who met me, told me that his father was too unwell to rise and preferred that no one enter the chapel unless he were about. Young Yarnick made a half-apologetic excuse for his father, remarking that Sir Alfred Yarnick was perhaps inclined to be a little more careful, but that considering what had happened, we must agree that the need of his carefulness had been justified. He added also that even before the horrible attack of the butler, his father had been just as particular, always keeping the key and never allowing the door to be unlocked, except when the place was in use for divine service, and for an hour each forenoon when the cleaners were in. To all this I nodded understandingly, but when presently the young man left me, I took my duplicate key and made for the door of the chapel. I went in and locked it behind me, after which I carried out some intensively and interesting and rather weird experiments. These proved successful to such an extent that I came out of the place in a perfect fever of excitement. I inquired for Mr. George Yarnick and was told that he was in the morning room. Come along, I said, when I had found him. Please give me a lift. I have something exceedingly strange to show you. He was probably very much puzzled, but came quickly. As we strode along, he asked me for a score of questions, to all of which I just shook my head, asking him to wait a little. I led the way to the armory. Here I suggested that he should take one side of a dummy dressed in half-plate armor, whilst I took the other. He nodded, though obviously vastly bewildered, and together we carried the thing to the chapel door. When he saw me take out my key and open the way for us, he appeared even more astonished, but held himself in, evidently waiting for me to explain. We entered the chapel and I locked the door behind us, after which we carted the armored dummy up the aisle to the gate of the chancel rail, where we put it down upon its round wooden stand. Stand back, I shouted suddenly as young Yarnick made a movement to open the gate. My God, man, you mustn't do that. Do what? He asked, half startled and half irritated by my words and manner. Just one minute, I said. Just stand to the side a moment and watch. He stepped to the left while I took the dummy in my arms and turned it to face the altar, so that it stood close to the gate. Then standing well away on the right side, I pressed the back of the thing so I had leant forward a little upon the gate, which flew open. In the same instant, the dummy was struck a tremendous blow that hurled it into the aisle, the armor rattling and clanging upon the polished marble floor. Good God! shouted young Jarnick, and ran back from the chancel rail, his face very white. Come and look at the thing, I said, and led the way to where the dummy was. Its armored upper limbs all splayed adrift in unusual contortions. I stooped over it and pointed. There, driven right through the thick steel breastplate, was a wayful dagger. Good God! said young Jarnick again. Good God, it's a dagger! The thing's been stabbed, same as Bennett! Yes, I replied, and saw him glance swiftly towards the entrance of the chapel. But I will do him the justice to say that he never budged an inch. Come and see how it was done, I said, and led the way back to the chancel rail. From the wall to the left of the altar, I took down a long, curiously ornamented iron instrument, not unlike a short spear. The sharp end of this I inserted in a hole in the left-hand gatepost of the chancel gateway. I lifted hard, and a section of the post from the floor upward bent inward toward the altar, as though hinged at the bottom. Down it went, leaving the remaining part of the post standing. As I bent the movable portion lower there came a quick click, and a section of the floor slid to one side, showing a long, shallow cavity sufficient to enclose the post. I put my weight on the lever and hove the post down into the niche. Immediately there was a sharp clang as some catch snicked in and held it against the powerful operating spring. I went over now to the dummy, and after a few minutes' work, I managed to wrench the dagger loose out of the armor. I brought the old weapon and placed its hilt in a hole near the top of the post, where it fitted loosely, the point upward. After that, I went again to the lever and gave another strong heave. 
and the post descended about a foot to the bottom of the cavity, catching there with another clang. I withdrew the lever and the narrow strip of floor slid back, covering post and dagger, and looking no different from the surrounding surface. Then I shut the chancel gate and we both stood well to one side. I took the spear-like lever and gave the gate a little push so that it opened. Instantly there was a loud thud and something sank through the air, striking the bottom wall of the chapel. It was the dagger. I showed Yannick then that the other half of the post had sprung back into place, making the whole post as thick as the one upon the right-hand side of the gate. There, I said, turning to the young man and tapping the divided post. There's the invisible thing that used the dagger. But who the deuce is the person who set the trap? I looked at him keenly as I spoke. My father is the only one who has a key, he said. So it's practically impossible for anyone to get in and meddle. I looked at him again but it was obvious that he had not re reached out to any conclusion. See here, Mr. Yannick, I said, perhaps rather curter than I should have done, considering what I had to say. Are you quite sure that Sir Alfred is quite balanced, uh, mentally? He looked at me half-frightenedly and flushing a little. I realized then how badly I put it. I, I don't know, he replied, after a slight pause and was then silent, except for one or two incoherent half-remarks. Tell her the truth, I said. Haven't you suspected something now and again? You needn't be afraid to tell me. Well, he answered slowly, I'll admit I've thought my father a little, a little strange perhaps at times, but I've always tried to think I was mistaken. I've always hoped no one else would see it. You see, I'm very fond of the old governor. I nodded. Quite right, too, I said. There's not the least need to make any kind of scandal about this. We must do something noble in a quiet way. No fuss, you know. I should go and have a chat with your father and tell him we found out about this thing. I touched a divided post. Young Yarnick seemed very grateful for my advice and after shaking my hand pretty hard, took my key and let himself out of the chapel. He came back in in about an hour, looking rather upset. He told me that my conclusions were nearly perfect. It was Sir Alfred Yarnick who had set the trap both on the night that the butler was nearly killed and on the past night. Indeed, it seemed that the old gentleman had said it every night for many years. He had learned of its existence from an old manuscript book in the castle library. It had been planned and used in an earlier age as a protection for the gold vessels of the ritual, which were, it seemed, kept in a hidden recess at the back of the altar. This recess Sir Alfred Yannick had utilized, secretly, to store his wife's jewelry. She had died some twelve years back, and the young man told me that his father had never seemed quite himself since. I mentioned to young Yannick how puzzled I was that the trap had been set before the service, on the night that the butler was struck, for if I understood him aright, his father had been in the habit of setting the trap late every night and unsetting it each morning before anyone entered the chapel. He replied that his father, in a fit of temporary forgetfulness, natural enough in his neurotic condition, must have set it too early and hence what had so nearly proved a tragedy. This is about all there is to tell. The old man is not, so far as I could learn, really insane in the popularly accepted sense of the word. He is extremely neurotic and has developed into a hypochondriac. The whole condition probably brought about the shock and sorrow resultant of the death of his wife, leading to years of sad broodings and to over much of his own company and thoughts. Indeed, young John had told me that his father would sometimes pray for hours together, alone in the chapel. Carnegie made an end of speaking and leaned forward for a spill. But you never told us just how you discovered the secret of the divided post and all that, I said, speaking for the four of us. Oh, that replied Carnegie, puffing vigorously at his pipe. I found, on comparing the photos of the one taken in the daytime, showed a thicker left-hand gatepost than the one taken at the night of the flashlight. That put me on the track. I saw at once that there might be some mechanical dodge at the back of the whole unusual business, and nothing at all of an abnormal nature. I examined the post, and the rest was simple enough, you know. By the way, he continued, rising and going to the mantelpiece, you may be interested to have a look at the so-called Wavell Dagger, Young Yarnick was kind enough to present it to me as a little memento of my adventure. He handed it round to us whilst we examined it, stood silent before the fire, puffing meditatively at his pipe. Yarnick and I made the traps so that it won't work, he remarked after a few moments. I've got the daggers, you see, and old Bellet's getting about again, so that the whole business can be hushed up decently. All the same, I fancy the chapel will never lose his reputation as a dangerous place. Should be pretty safe now to keep valuables in. There's two things you haven't explained yet, I said. What do you think caused the two clangy sounds while you were in the chapel in the dark? 
Do you believe the soft, tready sounds are real or only a fancy with you being so worked up and tense? Don't know for certain about the clangs, replied Carnegie. I'm puzzled quite a bit about them. I can only think that the spring which worked the post must have given a trifle, slipped, you know, in the catch. If it did, under such a tension, it would make a bit of a ringing noise. And a little sound goes a long way in the middle of the night when you're thinking of ghostesses. You can understand that, eh? <laughs> yes, I agreed. And the other sounds? Well, the same thing. I mean, the extraordinary quietness may help to explain these a bit. They may have been some unusual enough sound that would never have been noticed under ordinary conditions. Or they may have been only fancy. It is just impossible to say. They were disgustingly real to me. As for the slithery noise, I am pretty sure that one of the tripod legs of my camera must have slipped a few inches. If it did so, it may have easily have jolted the lens cap off the baseboard, which would account for that unusual little tap which I heard directly after. How do you account for the dagger being in its place above the altar when you first examined it that night? I asked. How could it be there when at the very moment it was set in the trap? That was my mistake, replied Carnegie. The dagger could not possibly have been in the sheath at the time, though I thought it was. You see, the curious cross-hilt sheath gave the appearance of the complete weapon, as you can understand. The hilt of the dagger protrudes very little above the continued portion of the sheath. A most inconvenient arrangement for drawing quickly. He nodded sagely the lot of us and yawned, then glanced at the clock. All right, out you go, he said in a friendly fashion, using the recognized formula. I fancy a sleep. We rose, shook him by the hand, and went out presently into the night, and the quiet of the embankment, and so to our homes. <laughs>